Hello, this is Jenny McFadden here to tell you about querying big data with Amazon Redshift. This is a final project for CSCI E90 Cloud Computing at the Harvard Extension School with Dr. Zoran Georgevic. This presentation was recorded December 14, 2013. Amazon Redshift is a petabyte scale data warehousing solution featuring massively parallel processing, or MPP, between a leader node and many compute nodes. It sounded a lot like Amazon's Elastic MapReduce to me at first, so I did a little research to understand how it was different. Redshift boasts much faster querying times for big data than MapReduce methods. How do they accomplish this? Redshift is actually a PAR Excel database under the hood, offering full SQL querying capabilities. Since Redshift supports indexing via primary keys and foreign keys, a sort key and a distribution key, queries are reportedly much faster than the performance you would see in a MapReduce job. Redshift also utilizes columnar storage, which allows for more efficient compression and usage of blocks. Currently, Redshift is being offered at $1,000 per terabyte per year, or at $0.85 cents per hour. There is no free tier, but there is also no upfront cost, and you can save your cluster to S3, stop running the cluster, and start it back up again later. I read one report that estimated costs of running your own data warehouse at $20,000 to $25,000 per terabyte per year. Redshift seems bargain basement at that comparison. Redshift is scalable, can be encrypted, and is automatically backed up to S3 storage. It's a relatively new offering to the Amazon Cloud Suite, having been released last year, in December 2012. Another advantage to Redshift, besides lightning fast analysis, is that it uses a PostgreSQL driver for JDBC and ODBC connections which makes it simple to connect it via commercial reporting tools. I will say that I tried for several hours to connect it to Crystal Reports with no success, which was a disappointment. It should be able to do this, but it wasn't straightforward. The downside of Redshift is that loading data can be slow. Amazon recommends organizing data first with Elastic Map Reduce, and then moving it into Redshift using their internal data pipeline. I'll also point out that while it's a bargain for what you're getting, it's still not cheap. You would need to make sure you're doing enough big data queries to justify importing all your data into another format to run queries. This project and demonstration set out to understand how to use Redshift and to answer the question, how much faster is Redshift than EMR when querying data? I'll show you how to load the same sample data into both systems and run queries in both so you can compare the results. The workflow is as follows. Step 1. Use Elastic MapReduce to organize data and export the result into S3 using a Hive script. Step 2. Create a Redshift cluster programmatically using Java. Step 3. Load the data from S3 into Redshift programmatically using Java. Step 4. Query the Redshift data using SQL Workbench. Step 5. Query the Elastic MapReduce data using Hive. Step 6. Delete both clusters. In the end, we're going to review the SQL statement runtimes and compare the two methods. In Step 1, we're going to use Amazon's Elastic MapReduce to organize data. I started from the tutorial we used in Homework 11 the contextual advertising using Apache Hive and Amazon EMR by Richard at AWS. You don't need to complete the entire tutorial, but at least get an EMR cluster running, SSH into it, and create the impressions and clicks tables from the sample data. Add at least one partition of data. You should also have an S3 bucket ready to use for the sample data exports. I've created a Hive script that will create two export tables that will be stored in the S3 bucket you've created. Let's take a look at that script now. The external command is important. This means the table data will be stored in S3. Note I'm including the DT in this export as one of the columns. This is the partition name. It's not necessary for this example since there's only one partition, 
but you can imagine running this script every day and the DT string would allow you to group by day later. The delimiter being used is the default, the pipe, but you could specify a different one here. The location is the S3 bucket that you should own that you will access later via Java. Now that the table is created, the insert overwrite table command populates the table with data from the impressions table. The flat file is automatically generated in the S3 bucket under the impressions directory. The code also creates the clicks export table and stores it in another S3 folder called clicks. Go ahead and leave that cluster running and that SSH window with Hive running open. We'll come back to that to run some queries later on. We'll now move on to step two, creating a Redshift cluster. This tutorial assumes you have Eclipse installed along with the AWS plugin. Open Eclipse and create a new AWS Java project. After adding your credentials, add the PostgreSQL driver to the build path. Note Amazon requests using Postgres 8.4-703, which is not the latest version of the Postgres driver. Create a new class called createCluster.java and copy the code provided. CreateCluster has several functions. The first is CreateCluster, which creates a cluster with the identifier name, master username, password, database name, node type, and number of nodes. Note that the username and password are for the database, not the node itself, and if a database name is not specified, the default dev is created. Describe clusters identifies the desired cluster and calls print result, which prints the identified cluster and database properties. After create cluster is called, wait for cluster ready is called, which gives feedback when the cluster is available. Note this will take around 10 to 20 minutes. In step three, we will load the data into Redshift using load.java. This will use the data output from the Hive export in step one, which is being stored in an S3 bucket. Load.java connects to the cluster first, obtains the JDBC URL, and then the database. The build JDBC URL function builds the JDBC URL you need to connect to the database from the database properties available to you. Alternatively, you can copy and paste this from the cluster console. Load.java will also create the impressions and clicks tables. This is where you would tune your tables depending on your query needs. The sort key, this is the column the data is sorted by on disk. Use this if doing frequent range filtering or equality filtering on that column, or you need to run alphabetic or ordered by date type queries. The distribution key determines how a table's data is distributed across compute nodes. If you frequently join a table, set the columns you join as the distribution key. If your tables are mostly denormalized, there's no need to specify a distribution key. Amazon will just distribute the data evenly. Be careful though in choosing a distribution key. You want your data distributed evenly. Some other best practices include defining relationships, such as primary keys and foreign keys, using the date, time, and integer variables when possible, and choosing the smallest possible column size. The table data is compressed on disk until you run a query. The temporary tables used for a query are not compressed. Load.java is now ready to attempt to load the data using the SQL copy command. The copy command utilizes the AWS data pipeline and is recommended for faster loading than the insert command. Load.java will output a count of the impressions and clicks tables after loading them to assure you that the data has loaded. If you get errors, and you probably will at first, you can check the STL underscore error table by running select star from STL underscore error in SQL Workbench. Common errors include mismatched type, not enough space in the column for data attempting to load, and among other things. When you get an error, the data load will stop. It won't skip that record and move on. I found it cleanest just to drop the entire table and start the program over again after making an adjustment. I found that this program took about two to three minutes to load this sample data. Now that the data is loaded, 
we can query it using SQL Workbench or any other reporting tool that accepts a JDBC connection with a PostgreSQL driver. You'll need SQL Workbench and a copy of the PostgreSQL driver. I found it easiest to put it in my SQL Workbench directory, but you can point it to another directory. You'll also need the JDBC URL, which is easy to grab from the AWS Redshift console page. Drill into your cluster, and it's on the configuration page. Create a connection profile in SQL Workbench with the PostgreSQL driver, the JDBC URL, the database username, and the database password you set in createcluster.java. When you configure the PostgreSQL driver, the URL you need to use there is the JDBC URL of your cluster. Make sure that auto commit is on. This means you won't have to remember to commit your transactions each time and wonder why your changes weren't showing up later. Once the connection is established, you can add a SQL statement to the Statements tab. You can open more than one tab or run multiple statements in the same statement window. Each query will return results in a separate Results tab. The query execution time will appear in the bottom right of the Results screen, as well as the Messages tab. Amazon Console also has a record of your queries, their run times, execution plans, and other metrics for analysis. This project included running the same queries on the same data sets in Redshift and on the MapReduce data using Hive. To connect to the EMR instance, SSH into the cluster using the Hadoop username and EC2 URL. Start Hive by typing Hive. If you've left the, console, the Hive console from the previous steps open, you can just start from there. Notice that Hive is syntactically different than standard SQL. Once you've run all the queries you want, you should delete both the Redshift and EMR clusters. You have the option to take a snapshot of the Redshift cluster before deleting it. It will store this snapshot in S3, and you can recreate the cluster from that snapshot when you are ready. Delete cluster.java will programmatically delete the Redshift cluster but currently does not take a snapshot of it since this was just sample data. This functionality could easily be added. Create cluster could easily be altered to start the cluster from that snapshot. The EMR cluster can be terminated from the console. You have the option to clone this cluster, which is equivalent to the snapshot. You can start the cluster back up again from this clone. If termination protection was added, you'll need to turn this off before terminating the cluster. So what were the results of my test queries? Redshift won by a landslide. While some of the queries that select from the top stack of the data, like select all from impressions limit 10, took eight to nine seconds in Hive, Redshift was still faster with speeds of less than three seconds. The real difference can be seen in some of the more complex queries with joins and group by statements. Redshift only took 0.73 seconds to run the joined group by statement while Hive took over 20 minutes. That's a big difference if you have many statements to run on much larger data sets than this little sample data set. In conclusion, Redshift demonstrated itself to be much faster than Elastic MapReduce at querying data. Setup was easy, and it was fairly easy to program against the available API. There is solid documentation for such a new offering. The JDBC connection was nice to have since it allowed me to run queries through a nicer GUI interface application like SQL Workbench. Theoretically, you could connect it to a slicker reporting tool and make those fancy reports the marketing team dreams of. The integration with other Amazon offerings could be a bonus, unless you had all your other cloud tools elsewhere. The two downsides that I could see were the cost. It's an additional cost on top of what you're already running, it doesn't replace EMR, it just adds another layer to it. The other downside is that you're moving data again, twice. Even though Amazon has worked hard to make that internal data pipeline move as fast as possible, you're still moving big data to S3 and then again to Redshift. I looked, but I couldn't find a way to move that data directly from EMR to Redshift and skip S3. If you had enough reporting needs to outweigh the additional step of moving the data to S3, and Redshift, as well as the additional cost, it would definitely be worth a look.